Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to be spending most of our time in Psalm 88. So if you guys want to want to turn there, you can you can be ready for when we take take off. So last week we talked about accepting the sovereignty of God and recognizing his ability and our inability. And so this week I kind of want to look at the other side of the coin and I want to talk a little bit more about the idea of lament. Looking at when things are bad, when our hearts are hurting and when we are experiencing human life in some of the less fun things that we encounter. And it, I'm going to hold to the fact that recognizing God's sovereignty opens to us a path of praise and a way in which we can deal with limits. But that doesn't stop the trouble and that doesn't stop the and I think those are things for us to rightly wrestle with and think about. In fact, if you think about the book of Psalms, the most common subject in the book of Psalms is lament. There are far more psalms of lament than psalms of thanksgiving. Now, depending on where, how you choose to categorize and, you know, Lots of different scholars like to chop up the book of Psalms into its various parts as they see it. But over half of the book of Psalms is lament. And I think that should be something that we should look at in our churches being somewhat curious. Because I don't think the church as a whole has a place in its worship for lament. Whereas if we look at you know, the Old Testament here, their praise book has over half of its psalms being cries out to God in the midst of trouble and strife. There's a reality that exists here that no longer exists in our present day churches. And I think that's somewhat to our detriment. So in 2009, there was a typhoon called Ondoy that hit the Philippines and other islands in the Pacific Ocean, and 921 people died. And there was a lot of publicity, especially in the Philippines, of people seeing you know, tragic images of, you know, children being swept away by, by, by the river while, you know, while you know, holding onto a branch and, you know, praying to God for their, you know, no to be saved and then being swept away and drowned, and. In the face of that public sorrow, a lot of people began to assess in the Philippines some of the songs that they were singing. Um, well, one of the, one of the one of the popular hymns that they that they sang was trying you know, translates in English as the. God is with us and I will not drown. For the Christian life is, hap is a happy life indeed. God is with us, I will not be afraid. Even if I pass through the rivers, I will not drown. How do you think these praises resonate in the space of people who have just experienced this kind of natural disaster? I suspect that there were a lot of people 
who went to church, found those songs in front of them, and found themselves unable to sing them. It just, it wasn't speaking to their reality. And that's where the Psalms of Lament step in to fill, is it gives us a space in which we can address God when the praise isn't in our heart. And experiencing those points in time when praise isn't in our heart isn't a lack of faith on our own parts. And it's not due to a lack of joy. Well, I mean, I guess it can be. We, we, we know people who don't have a who don't have a joyous spirit, and as a result, they're not they're not praise focused. But that's not necessarily the case. It's okay for us to actually struggle. So I'm going to read from Psalm 88, which is sometimes considered to be the darkest psalm. In and we're going to explore how it addresses the idea of lament. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Right away we see that the psalm, the cry, the lament is spoken and towards God. It's being given to God. And within that, there is an implicit level of trust that the psalmist has. He cries out to God because he knows that God will answer. And he recognizes that God's answer is what he needs. If he didn't know God and had no faith in God, there would be no point in crying out to God. But he cries out and he cries out in sadness and confusion because he knows God and he knows what he is currently experiencing is not in line with the fullness of what God offers. His experience in life at the current point is not what he knows it could be. When we lament to God, likewise, it's also a sign of faith on our part. Because it shows us where our faith is if we're crying out to God. And I think this carries over to us corporately when we cry out together over you know, something that's troubling an individual or the state of the world or another such thing. There's a difference between lamenting to God and crying out you know, privately or in community, to whining and complaining. They're two very different ideas. What are some things that we whine about? Mom, that's not fair. <clears throat> Saya took the last pickle. See, we can give voice to complaint about those sorts of things. But, you know, Saya took the last pickle. Okay. What do you expect me to do about it? It's a complaint that's geared towards, in this case, the parent. And the parent has no authority to make the situation over the pickle better. There's no ability there, and there's not even really an expectation that's been voiced there. 
that cry doesn't have the same level of faith in it as to the sorts of cries that we see in, in the Psalms. For my soul is full of troubles and my life drives near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. This is describing serious pain, serious trouble. Scholars aren't entirely sure what to think about Sheol. You know, oftentimes it's simply translated as the grave, but it seems to be indicative of a specific place, but there's no real solid grasp of what, of what biblical Hebrew people would have thought concerning the afterlife or any of those sorts of things. That's relatively unstable. But this is a person who's at the end of their rope, and it's not the sort of situation to where they just simply need to buck up. Now, there are lots of times that when we, we encounter <clears throat> people who are struggling with things, we can look at their situation and realize, oh, all they really need is to square their shoulders back, stand up straight, and they'll be fine. I, I, again, as a parent, I see this in my children all the time. They come to me with a problem that they are currently experiencing. And the answer to that is, you just, you just need to stand up straight and confront it and deal with it, and you'll be fine. That's not the picture here. And I think too often, that's our base response to when someone struggles is to buck up. But that's not always the case. Now this person may literally be at death's door, they may literally not be, and I don't know if they need to be at death's door in order for their lament to be justified. <clears throat> See, lament gives us a space that we can have to step back and deal with tragedy when it occurs. So um, John Swinton, who is a Scottish theologian, you know, made a comment about the bombing in 1988 in Oma, which killed, you know, 38 or 28 people and over 200 people were, were seriously maimed. It was a car bombing that happened in Ireland. And he talked about this happened and he went to church the next Sunday and there wasn't anything in church said to talk about any of the tragedy that had happened. It was completely ignored. Now sometimes, I'm not a real good observer of the news. So news-wise, things can happen that I just miss, and that's why I wouldn't step up and address. But that was not the case here. Everyone knew what had happened you know, in their country. And there was just no space in the service to deal with it. And the people didn't know how to deal with it. And so they just proceeded on as though it hadn't happened. And yet, there's a sense of growth that we experience, that opportunity to trust God that comes in lament, that is so very vital for even within our own ability to cope with things and deal with things in our own health, for us to just simply not address the lamenting situations in our life can be physically damaging. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavily upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves, Salah. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. 
My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord, and spread out my hands to you. Okay, so the psalmist here takes another step deeper into the lament. Not only are they experiencing the strife, but the psalmist steps up and says, God, you have brought this on me. I'm experiencing this because of you. Those are some pretty bold words. And it's something for us to think very carefully about. And at some level, and in some situations, this could be literally true. This could be a Job-like experience going on, in which God is directly <clears throat> tied to the suffering that's occurring. It could be a situation where God is using suffering to bring out the good in something. It could be a refining fire situation. There could be judgment in play for a sin issue. Those sorts of things happen. And, and in those sorts of situations, this type of accusation could be literally true. However, I again, I don't think that needs to be the situation at play. Because I think there's another important truth that the psalmist is really recognizing. And it really shows us just how strong the psalmist's faith actually is. The psalmist believes that all that needs to happen to change his situation is for God to intervene. If the psalmist believes that, then the psalmist can also step back and say, so if God has chosen not to intervene, I then see God as being responsible for all of this. He has no other record. The way he is thinking if God is all I need, then the present situation means that God has to be putting me in this situation. He has no other recourse in how to see things. There's two important things for us to grasp out of this. The first is, sometimes we're not appropriate interpreters of our life situations. God may not be directly trying to put you in the pit, even though you perceive it to be that case. However, we certainly can step back and say, the struggling with God in that space on the psalmist's part really does show that faith. Because again, he has correctly understood the power and the sovereignty of God and his need for God in that space of lament. I, I find the words that the psalmist says here to be very difficult. But yet, I also step back and say, this was preserved for us. The struggle that the psalmist had was preserved for us to look at. And it was preserved without condemnation. We don't have a narrator sitting here shaking his finger at the psalmist saying, the psalmist got this wrong. So I think at some level we have to look at the, psalmist ex the psalmist's experience and say that God's okay with us struggling in that. It doesn't mean that there's not room for growth and it doesn't mean that the psalmist was correct in interpreting his situation. But I think it does show us that it's okay for us to struggle. And it's okay for us to even have questions for God. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in a battle? Are your wonders known in the darkness, or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, cry to you, in the morning my prayer comes before you, 
O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my, from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. So this psalm ends in the dark space. We don't see the resolution of the psalmist's issue. We're left in that dark space, and we're left in that dark space isolated. And that seems to be another component of the psalmist's cry and his grief, is I am in lament and I am alone. Because the psalmist isn't experiencing that relationship with God. No, he doesn't, he's not seeing God's face. And because he doesn't see God's face, that troubles him. It's the silence from God and the inability to be able to have a community around him to help him walk through it. Yet what I see in Psalm 88 is an authentic expression of worship. Because the psalmist is engaging in God in faith in the midst of the situation that he's in. And I think this is something that as Christians we really struggle with. Because when we are in that space where we should be lamenting, I think we feel pressure to not be. We feel pressure to make things as good as they possibly can be. Yes, I am struggling, but it will all turn out well in the end. Or, yes, I am struggling and hurting, but God is in control. And we voice these things not out of faith, but we voice them because we feel like the fact that we're struggling is inappropriate and isn't okay. And I think when we give voice to these praises that aren't actually in us. It's not actually honest. And that causes us to not actually connect with God. Likewise, it causes us to not actually connect with each other either. There, are, so as, as I was doing re research, one of the one of the books that I read talked about a, a church that he attended where every week they had someone from the congregation stand up and give a testimony. But beforehand, the testimonies were all pre-screened to make sure that they were going to be positive, uplifting messages that would edify the body. And if an individual were, would come up with a story that they saw as being too depressing to share, it, they would be like, well, that won't build up the body. You need to put a different spin on it. And gosh, how destructive is that? Not only to the person offering the story, but to their ability to relate with everyone else. When we put on that mask of everything's okay before God and it's not, we damage a relationship with him, but we do it with each other, too. When we have on the everything's okay mask when it's not. Because it's stopping us from being able to connect with other people who could walk with us. Now, Psalm 80 ends without a positive turn at the end, which I think solidifies for us the idea that, yeah, the struggle... Struggles happen, and struggles are okay, and this is a way to worship through it. This is a way to connect with God when you're in that heart of lament. 
But we're going to turn and take a look at Psalm 13 as well. Which, as, we, as, as, as I read through it, there's going to be a lot in Psalm 13 that's going to resonate in the same way as Psalm 88, with the exception of its ending. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he is still beautifully with me. The, the, the elements of the cry, I feel like, are very similar. You know, here it's centered around the phrase, how long? And again, I see that as a statement of faith. He's fully recognizing the sovereignty and control of God and the fact that God's capable of changing the situation and he, that's what he needs is to God to step in and change the situation. In his cry of how long, he's really not looking for God to answer back and say 18 months, 7 days, and 3 minutes. He's really looking for God to say, 